Praise the Lord. I believe you've been sitting for a long time. I think we need to stand up and stretch up a little bit uh, before we fall asleep. <laughs> it's been a long day. I was looking at my wristwatch and saying to myself that around this time, 24 hours ago, uh, Uncle Tom, skin, I was just about to conclude his message. And uh, as a giant preacher, uh, <clears throat> was able to, 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 to sustain the congregation. Now, here comes the grasshopper, and I'm just beginning. <laughs> well, praise the Lord, you may be seated. On behalf of the, the Africans attending Atlanta 88, we want to express and establish our profound gratitude to the 35 sponsoring persons and the planning or the steering committee of this Congress. On behalf of the near 50 million evangelical believers that do compose the Association of Evangelicals of Africa and Madagascar that I do represent as the General Secretary, I bring you greetings. I also want to register the greetings from the World Evangelical Fellowship, a body that I also serve as the Chairman of the Executive Council. From all that has been said, in this conference, or this Congress, I do believe that all that we need to remind ourselves of, and the message that uh, the Lord has laid upon my heart, coming from across the ocean to this side, is the old message that I do believe you've heard several times, but it helps to remind ourselves of what our faith is all about and the mission that has been committed to us. It has been said that the credibility of the message cannot rise above the credibility of the messenger. And it may interest you to know that none of the speakers that have stood in this place to address this Congress was given a topic ahead of time. At least I wasn't. I was led, I was told, just to bring the message that the Lord will help you bring to the Congress. And though my message was prepared months ago, and without comparing note with either Tony Evans, who happened to be my, my classmate, nor with the, the bishop, is Grace McKinney, nor Tom Skinner, the spirit of the living God has been driving in the same message again and again. And the message that the Lord has laid upon my heart to share with you this evening is a message that I believe is very critical and crucial at this particular hour. A message for today. A message for today. The Lord is addressing us, you and me, on the subject of integrity. The topic of my message is integrity. The text was read to us by my brother Ak, 1 Kings chapter 9 verses 3 
to 5. That's my main text on the subject of integrity. At the end of the day, we come to realize that it is not our way the race began that matters, but our way the race ended. At a point of transition, God said to Solomon, I have heard your prayer and your plea is before me. I have consecrated this temple which you have built by putting my name upon it. My eyes and my heart will always be there. As for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decree and my laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David, your father. I underline in this text, in integrity of heart and uprightness. Years before this, statement was made by God to Solomon, listen to the petition of David, his father, recorded for us in Psalm 69, verse 6. May those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. May those who hope in you be not disgraced because of me. Those three words, because of me, speak of integrity. 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 What is integrity? As evangelicals, we cherish the tradition of being biblical. And I do believe I put a lot of emphasis on rightly dividing the word of truth. As Pentecostal, we are often accused of being emotional and sentimental, loud. But I do believe that it's biblical to pray with our spirit but at the same time pray with our mind. So I believe that it is right and appropriate for us to pay attention to what the Lord is saying on the subject of integrity. We pay close attention to it, and then when the appropriate time comes, we shout. What is integrity? Integrity is a word that is spoken of by everyone in the society. The politicians will want us to believe that they want people or candidates of integrity. They tell us to elect people of integrity to office. Business men are looking for men and women of integrity. And if the world the secular world is looking for people of integrity. You can imagine the church of Jesus Christ. What is integrity? Integrity is the state of being entire, wholeness, probity, honesty, and uprightness. The English meaning for integrity is derived from the Latin word integer, which literally means togetherness, wholeness, completeness. The Hebrew word that is used for integrity is the word T-O-M, Tom. 
term occurs about 50 times in the Old Testament. And it is used to describe men and women of God who walked with God and they were right with God. They were blameless before God. It is a word that is used to describe men like Noah, Abraham, Job, and David. The most common Old Testament synonym for integrity is the word blamelessness. Blamelessness. In the New Testament, the word integrity occurs only once. But the concept is very common. It occurs only in Titus chapter 2 verse 7. In your teaching, show integrity. But as we flip through the New Testament, we discover that again and again, the writers emphasized the place of integrity in both the Christian witness and the Christian mission. To Timothy, Paul said, watch for your life and your doctrine closely. Train yourself to be godly. Keep yourself pure. Flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness with those who call upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Be pure. In other words, be a man of integrity. Peter puts it this way. Just as he who has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all you do, for it is written, be holy as I am holy. By integrity, therefore, we are speaking of godliness or Christ-likeness in all manners of the Christian life and Christian witness. Evangelist E. Stanley Jones, who served for many, many years in India, one day I had a conversation with the nationalist, the Indian nationalist Mahatma Gandhi. Stanley asked him, how can Christianity become relevant in India? Listen to the response from this man, Mahatma Gandhi. He said, and I quote, I would suggest first and foremost, that all you Christians begin to live more like Jesus Christ. Then, then, your message will be relevant. That is integrity. It is said that action speaks louder than voice. Mahatma Gandhi says, live more like Jesus Christ. Be a man, a woman of integrity. Then your message will be relevant. John Maxwell, the senior pastor of Skyland West Wesleyan Church in California, says, and I believe it's right, I can preach a profound sermon, but if I am not a godly example, I will have no credibility. Therefore, my first priority is communicating holiness by a holy life. Integrity. In a documentary video called Viva Cristo Rey, which is a documentary of a holistic ministry under the leadership of a Roman Catholic father by name of 
Rick Thomas at a place called Warren in Mexico. Father Rick Thomas said of integrity, we Christians are preaching good news, whereas we ourselves are bad news. We are preaching good news, but we ourselves are bad news. No integrity. One of the tragedies of our time is what I have labeled as fractionalized Christianity. Fractionalized Christianity simply means you have one foot in the church or in Christ and the other foot in the world or in the devil. When in the church we sing the loveliest and the most superb Negro spirituals, we are the most saintly. But when we are in the world, we are secular as seculars come. There is no difference between us and those infidels, the reprobate, the unbelievers. No integrity. Without integrity, we may reach the heights, but not true success. Without integrity, we may impress the crowds, but not convert. Without integrity, we may soar like sky rocket, but we come down deflated like a balloon. Integrity is what the Christian faith is all about. Speaking of the moral and spiritual slide among the evangelical leaders in the United States of America, Billy Melvin, who is the executive director of the National Association of Evangelicals, asked the question, and I quote, why are we not making a greater impact upon our culture for decency, morality, and righteousness? He proceeds to answer his own question by saying, several reasons may be advanced, but high on any list, has to be our failure to practice personal integrity. We have been neutralized by the siren song of the world. Having fallen into the world's agenda, we live like the world. End of quote. This is a tragedy. We have to remember that on that judgment day, when you and I stand before the Lord of glory to give an account of our sojourner in this place, it is not how many souls that we saved that he will take account of to start with. In fact, he said, many will come on that day and say, in your name, we perform miracles in your name, we fed the hungry. In your name, we did this and that. But the master will say, I don't know you. There has been lack of integrity. I want to quickly share with you dimensions of integrity. When we speak of integrity, or when the Bible speaks of integrity, what are the dimensions? There are five major dimensions outlined for us in the Word of God concerning the subject of integrity. The first one is the area of sexual purity. No compromise. It is black or white. It cannot be, well, maybe it's gray. It's either black or white. 
biblical integrity on the subject of sexual purity is holiness. Holiness. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am the Lord, your sufficient one, your heir shall die. Walk before me and be blameless. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. We will not understand the impact and the import of that expression, walk before me and be blameless until we go back to Genesis chapter 16. And then we discover that for almost a period of 13 to 14 years, there had been silence between God and his friend Abraham. Why? Because of Abraham's fall, he had fallen from grace to grass. You remember the story of Agar. And because God is a holy God and will not put up with unholy things, God, the Holy Spirit, will not pour himself upon unholy vessels. God shut up the door of heaven and will not communicate with Abraham. And the fourth encounter after a period of 14 years is Abraham, walk before me and be blameless. Who says to us that it does not matter what we do? We cannot dichotomize the gift of the Spirit from the fruit of the Spirit of God. Biblical integrity speaks of both and. It's not either or, it's both and. I cannot preach separation to the world. I cannot invite them to embrace a holy God when I am living in sin. I have no justification. I've got to go to the cross and settle the account before I can tell people, look to the Lord. I do believe, my dear brothers and sisters, that if our messages are going to be powerful, we better back those messages, the invitation to Christ with a life of holiness, a life of purity. Speaking of this aspect of integrity, listen to what Apostle Paul says. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some are ignoble. If a man cleanses himself, it's my religious obligation, not an optional thing that if I like to, or if I choose to, do it. It is not optional. It is obligatory. If a man cleanses himself, I am responsible for a life of cleanliness. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes. Made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do every good work. Before my conversion as a Muslim, we used to say, show me this Christ that you are preaching about in terms of the life that you live. Show me. Show me. And the world is still looking for ambassadors of Jesus Christ. When I gave my life to Jesus Christ, or rather putting it in, in proper theological language, when Christ saved me, 
the first change that I noticed in my life is a new nature. A nature that craved after holiness and righteousness and purity to be like him. My life before then, in the area of sex, was a mess. I was, as was said in the introduction, I was very well known in the city. I came from a royal family. I remember the practice of, uh, I, I, in a big house, the mansion that I lived in, I would have three or four girlfriends visiting me at the same time, kept in four different rooms, and now I will uh, go in circuit, you know, uh, after, after talking good words to this one and telling her that she is the only one and there is none other, I will go to the next one and say the same thing. I'm messing around and what have you. But the first thing I noticed when Christ came into my life, he put an end to that. New life he gave. New life he gave. Jesus is not in the business of patching together. Let's patch it together. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. What is that newness if it is not sexual purity? The Bible says that all other sins that man commits are outside of their body. The Bible places a lot of emphasis on the area of sexual purity. Yes, Temptations may come, and they do come in myriads. But a man of integrity, a woman of integrity, will be sustained by the power of God. I put it before you, my dear sisters and brothers. When the devil tempts us with sexual sin, it is not a time to sit down and dialogue. You may be strong, she may be weak. In a time of sexual temptation, what a man of integrity does is to flee. Don't play with fire, it burns. Fire burns. Samson was a strong man, but in this area, he blew it. Integrity. Integrity. I do believe that God does forgive, and when a brother or a sister confesses, God forgives, but I strongly believe, I'm a strong believer, and the fact that we must not, we must not make our salvation, our Christian testimony, that cheap. That yes, there is forgiveness, I can always go to the cross, as a result, I don't persevere, as a result, I don't purify myself. God calls us to a life of purity. In Africa, when the story came across, of the brethren who fell on this side of the Atlantic, our great leaders, the common talk among the evangelicals across the whole spectrum is, wow, if that is what faith is all about, now, I wonder if I want to have anything to do with it. In the nation of Zambia, the television program of one of the, the, telev uh, the television evangelists that I have in mind was immediately removed from the national television by a secular, a secular station. They are not Christian. 
The world is expecting better things from us. The standard that the world has placed before us is high, and they have the right to demand that. Because we preach a holy God. Sexual purity is the first dimension of biblical integrity. Let me move on to the second dimension, but before then, I want to quickly read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, a passage that has meant so much to me. Paul speaking on the area, on the issue of integrity, sexual purity, says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but will do it to get a, a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No. I beat my body. Look at that. I beat my body. I make it my slave. My sexual passion is my slave. I'm not going to be a slave to it. And then, after falling, say, Oh, the devil made me do it and cry. No, 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 no. The spirit kissed me from falling. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Sexual integrity. Probably the black evangelical churches will contribute this to Christendom. Maybe this is an area of contribution from you, my brothers, from you, my sisters, the area of integrity, that it might be said of us, here goes a woman of integrity, here goes a man of integrity. We may not be popular, we may not be famous, but let's be people of integrity. The second area that I want to mention very quickly is the area of money. You've heard it said that money is not evil. It is only the love of money that is bad. Well, I want to take you back to the theology of Jesus and say that there is something demonic in money. There is something evil in money. There is a force behind money. I believe that the theology behind Matthew chapter 6 verse 24, where Jesus Christ says that you cannot serve God and mammon, where he places money side by side with God, underlines the fact that there is a power behind what we call money and literally people there are people who are worshiping money it happened then it's happening today you can check daniel chapter 5 verses 4 and 23 one of the gods of babylon at the time of daniel was god of silver and gold and today, in this book, Idols of Our Time, one of the idols of our time is money. Money, which is colorally materialism. 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 May we be one against this idol. And may we be men and women of integrity 
when it comes to the stewardship of money, of money. With money, many are falling by the wayside. You remember the story of Gehazi, Elisha's disciple. It was money that brought his downfall. Money. He became leprous because of money. And of course, you remember the story of Judas, the treasurer of the bound of 12 disciples. Money has power. I believe that it is more than just betraying the Lord Jesus Christ for 30 pieces of silver. There is a power behind money. And I believe that tonight God is warning us to be careful. To be careful. There are many today who claim to be in the ministry who are enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ, whose gods are their belly, and they are after only Mr. Green, the dollars. During my, my visit in May this year, I watched on your TV uh, a kind of a panel discussion on the issue of, uh, 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 the, I think that they had brought uh, some uh, heavyweights of, among the evangelical uh, television evangelists and what have you to discuss this issue of what, what should be the, the responsibility of the body of Jesus Christ to our brothers who are falling. And I think that the, the proprietor of the, or the moderator of the evening was emphasizing the fact that the issue is not really getting so saved. The issue is money. This pie, this pie <laughs> that is before us, uh, uh, Mr. X wants uh, this percentage of it, and Mr. Z wants this percentage of it. And the, the battle that is going on on a television is not uh, the battle of uh, saving souls, getting people rescued, but rather money, 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 money. Is our age and generation prepared for the biblical indictment that godliness with contentment is great gain? For we brought nothing into this world and we can take nothing out of it. But if you have food and clothing, let us be content. We are living in a society of more and more, bigger and bigger, and better and better. And to suffer for the cause of Jesus Christ is becoming old-fashioned. Money. Money. A man of integrity in the area of money will say to the church that is calling him or her to be the pastor, even if you are not able to pay me, God will provide. How many of our pastors are going to churches today because God will provide? Living by faith. The first business is to settle what will be take home money. The third area that I will quickly, because my time is, is running out, I will quickly mention, uh, and you <laughs> <laughs> I know that there are many students among us. The third area I want to mention is the area of intellectual honesty. It is commonly said that stealing from one source is plagiarism. But stealing from 100 sources is research. <laughs> For a Bible-believing evangelist, that is wrong. We must be intellectually honest. Biblical integrity in this particular area demands that sources be recognized when we are borrowing ideas from others. Biblical integrity in this area, in this area speaks of 
say no when we don't know. Intellectual integrity condemns all forms of laziness and shallowness and superficiality and mediocrity that buries academic excellence under the fog of pseudo-spirituality. When we do not prepare, we have not studied the situation, we have not done our homework, we have not researched, and then we go out there to make a fool of ourselves and run back and say, people don't listen to our message. We have not listened, we have not researched. We don't even know what the issues are. We do not scratch where the people are itching. Integrity calls for intellectual honesty. The former speaker of the House of Assembly in the country of my domicile, Kenya, once accused the politicians of what uh, progressive illiteracy. He said that once the politicians are elected and they get to the House of Parliament, the only two papers they read are the government white paper and the daily newspaper. And as a result, they become progressive illiterates. I believe the same thing could be said of many of the evangelical evangelists and pastors how traditional it is to say, well, to be an evangelist, you don't really need a Bible college education. My dear brothers and sisters, you do. The world out there is cleverer. They will ask you questions, bombard you left, right, and center, that will send you to your corner based. And you begin to question the authenticity of the word of God. You begin to question, is, is Jesus the only savior after all? When they come with all kinds of philosophy, that yes, you can make it to that journey by following Buddha or this path or that path. We've got to be intellectually honest. Integrity demands it. The fourth area that I want to mention very quickly is the area of ministerial faithfulness. Faithfulness. Writing to the Corinthian believers, Apostle Paul states, it is appointed to every steward only to be faithful. Faithfulness in evangelistic outreach to Paul is a determination to preach the gospel where Christ was not yet known. I wonder what has happened to that portion of scripture. When I see all of our evangelistic and our missionary efforts going only to one direction, the places that are oversaturated and overreached and superreached, the places that are cool and secure, safe from all alarm. I see all oh, these people, they come to Africa, oh, we, uh, the Lord has sent us, uh, we, uh, we want to start a new, a, a new ministry. And I say, well, why, why Nairobi of all places? Why, why this place? This is already overreached. Why can't you go to Saudi Arabia, or Libya, or Morocco, or, or they, are not, they are not part of the world to be reached? We are very selective. We only go to places that we yeah. have. <laughs> Statistics tell us that 2% of the evangelical missionary resources in terms of money and personnel and expertise, technical expertise, is given to evangelism or mission among the Muslims. And yet, they constitute the second largest people group in terms of unreached people in the world. What are we doing about, about that? Empire building. No wonder 
we begin to accuse ourselves of sheep stealing. This is my territory. <laughs> if the kingdom is that of Jesus Christ, if the glory is for him, if you are not seeking any recognition of fat pocket, why don't we go to places of hardship where the battle is severe and fierce among the Muslims, the Hindus, and the Buddhists? And I understand they are all over America today, <laughs> this people group. Faithfulness and integrity to Apostle Paul can be spelled in this particular area as readiness to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. The readiness to die for the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul will go to any lane because of his faithfulness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his letter to the Roman believers, he said, I have no more territory to cover in this area. <laughs> this place is already covered. I'm ready now to join in on. And on my way to Spain, I will call on you. I like that. This place is, is just too much. I, I've already covered it. I'm moving on. I'm moving on. And I do believe that maybe Atlanta 88 will give us this vision. To be witnesses of integrity, many those who dare to invade new territory. I mean, we are managing a lot, many of us, we have, we have managed the visions of Tom Skinner, the visions of others like him. You know, the, what, we are new visions, new forms of evangelistic outreach. People ready to take risks. That's integrity. Ready to launch out into new area. And the final area I want to quickly mention, and I'm skipping my, my something here, because this guy keeps telling me I must wrap one up. The fifth area of integrity is the area of compassion. We've heard a lot about that. Compassion. The readiness to serve, the readiness to spend and be spent, the readiness to prefer others to save, all of these are referred to as authenticity, compassion. Compassion asks the question, if I don't do it, what will happen to them? In bringing this message to a close, I want to give you a quick defense of integrity. When a man a woman of integrity falls into a temptation. I want to assure you, God will be the first person to rally around that individual. It does not matter what the situation is. If you are a man of integrity, if you are a woman of integrity, even when traps are deliberately set up for you, God will keep you from falling into the trap. In Genesis chapter 20, verses 5 and 6, God, knowing the heart of Abimelech, knowing that that Gentile was a man of integrity, said, because of your integrity, I have kept you from sinning. God keeps a man of integrity. God will keep you when you're a man or woman of integrity. Integrity will always pass the test of trial, as in the case of the three Hebrew children. And as in the case of Daniel, integrity will always pass the test of trial. 
Should a man of integrity sleep in times of trial or succumb to temptation, he who knows the heart will forgive. Listen to what happens in Psalm 41, verse 12 to David. In my integrity, you uphold me and you set me in your presence. In my integrity, you uphold me and you set me in your presence. That's following the affair with Bathsheba. But the Lord knew that the heart of David was one of integrity. And though he had slipped, God, God, God cleansed him, forgave him, and restored him. Integrity will always restore the woman or the man of integrity. Unlike David, his father, Solomon sacrificed integrity at the altar of 700 wives and 300 concubines. And you know what followed? He was led astray. He started a wise man. He ended a fool. He ended a fool. And at the end of his life, Solomon said, of all of his own evangelization and what have you, vanity upon vanity, all is vanity, integrity, integrity, integrity. As we go, may the Lord make you and me people of integrity. Amen.